My First Bible presents... It was time to construct the tabernacle, just as God had told Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses explained everything they had to do to the Israelites. This is what God has ordered. Take from your belongings an offering for God. With generosity in your heart, bring God gold, silver, bronze, precious stones, skins, and fabrics. Moses also told them they would need agile men and women who knew of carpentry, crafts, weaving, and embroidery. For this construction, there would be two people in charge. Look, people of Israel, said Moses. Jehovah has named Bezalel, grandson of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. You spent grandson. And he has filled him with the Holy Spirit, with wisdom, intelligence, and creative capability to do the artistic work on gold, silver, bronze, and precious stones. He has also chosen Aholiab from the tribe of Dan, who he has filled with wisdom to make all kinds of crafts and designs on all the fabrics. And so, Bezalel and Aholiab carried out the work for the tabernacle, just as God had ordered, together with the people who had the same artistic spirit and to whom God had given the ability to carry out the work. The Israelites brought many offerings. They brought gold, silver, bronze, precious stones, skins, and cloth for the tabernacle. Day after day, the people kept bringing more and more offerings, more than was needed. So Moses had to tell them that enough was enough and not to bring any more. Thus, the Israelites stopped bringing offerings. And so, the construction of the tabernacle began exactly as God had requested. Inside the tent, they divided it into two parts. One they called the Holy of Holies. There, they placed the Ark of the Covenant, which had the commandments inside. The other part they called the Holy Place, which is where they placed a table of bread, a candlestick of pure gold, and an altar of incense. Outside the tent, they built and placed the altar of burnt offerings, where sacrifices and offerings would be made to God a bronze fountain, and an atrium at the entrance of the tent. And like that, they built the tabernacle. It was also called the sanctuary, which in Hebrew is mishkan, which means dwelling. God had chosen Aaron as the high priest of Israel, and his sons as priests. They were the ones who were going to represent God before the Israelites, as well as coordinate the worship of God and the sacrifices or offerings. A special garment was prepared for them. Aaron, as the high priest, wore a pectoral, which had twelve precious stones. Each one of them had the name of the twelve tribes of Israel engraved. On the turban, he had a plate of pure gold, which was engraved, Holiness to Jehovah. Finally, the tabernacle was complete. Moses inspected the work and saw that everything was exactly as God had wanted. Yay! And at that instant, huh? the cloud of God covered the tabernacle, and the glory of God was manifested there. Moses could not enter the tabernacle, because the cloud prevented him from doing so, and the glory of God filled the entire sanctuary. 
Whenever the cloud moved from the tabernacle, the Israelites were to leave camp and follow the cloud. But when the cloud stayed in the same place, the Israelites were also to stay, just as it was in the desert. God called Moses from the tent, giving him instructions on what to do in the tabernacle. God wanted the people of Israel to be holy. Holy means to be set apart, or set apart for a purpose. God wanted the Israelites to turn away from sin to live among themselves. Since sin kept them away from God and brought death. And since God is holy and pure, any impurity, even the smallest, would drop dead in the presence of God. And so, for the people to be free of sin and impurity, God explained how to become holy through five types of sacrifices or rituals. Two of them were a way for the Israelites to thank God for what he had given them before, offering him a gift from their harvest or livestock. The other three sacrifices were a way to ask God for forgiveness. When an Israelite sinned, he had to offer the blood of an animal so that it would die in his place. The Israelite who committed the sin had to put his hand on the head of the animal and symbolically pass on the sin he had committed. Then the animal would have the sin and that is why it had to be sacrificed and burned on the altar of holocausts. Huh? Oh my god! They would bring calves, lambs, goats, oxen, and doves. But all the offerings they brought had to be without flaws. Then Aaron and his sons were consecrated by Moses to be in the presence of God in the tabernacle. God, through Moses, told them what was required to be a priest. The priests had to remain holy because they represented the people before God, but they also represented God before the people. At one point, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, casually walked into God's presence. Each carrying his censer, and offered God a fire that he had not commanded. Immediately, a fire from God consumed them both. They die. God is pure goodness, but becomes dangerous for those who insult his holiness. And there, they understood that it was important mm -hmm. that the priests should remain holy. Later, God provided instructions for the people of Israel so they could be pure and holy. One of the instructions was about which clean animals could be eaten, and which animals were impure and should not be eaten. He also provided instruction on which festivals should be celebrated once a year. One was called the Day of Atonement, a day when the High Priest asks for forgiveness for all the Israelites. For that, he took two male goats. One of the goats would be an offering of purification for the people. The other goat was called the scapegoat. The priest would confess Israel's sins, symbolically lay his hands on this goat, and it would then be sent to the desert, so that Israel's sins would be washed away. This way, God would be able to live in peace with the people. God provided many more instructions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Moses concluded by telling the people that if they could obey and follow the commandments, they would be blessed. However, if they disobeyed, they wouldn't be able to enter the promised land that was promised to Abraham. And these are the commandments that God gave to Moses for the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Two years have passed since the Israelites left Egypt. God spoke to Moses in the tabernacle and said to him, Hold a census, count all of the community of Israel by tribe and by patriarchal families, listing all their names one by one. You and Aaron will recruit men older than 20 who are fit to go to war. For this, count on the collaboration of a man from each tribe who is the head of a patriarchal family. Okay. And that is what they did. They counted each Israelite, organized them by tribe, and recruited young men for war. God had told Moses not to count Levi's tribe. He told him the Levites were in charge of the tabernacle and all its components. They would oversee transporting, assembling, and disassembling everything related to the tabernacle. They would also oversee taking care of the sanctuary of the covenant. Later, God explained to Moses and Aaron how the camps of each tribe of Israel would be organized and where they would be located. In the center of the campsite was the tabernacle. On the east side would be Judah's tribe, Issachar's tribe, and Zebulun's tribe. On the south side would be Reuben's tribe, Simeon's tribe, and Gad's tribe. On the north side would be Dan's tribe, Asher's tribe, and Naphtali's tribe. On the west side would be the sons of Joseph, Ephraim's and Manasseh's tribes, and next to those would be the tribe of Benjamin. Around the tabernacle is where the Levites were located. They were divided into three families. To the north was the family of Merari, to the south, the family of Kohath, and on the west side, the family of Gershon. These three were the sons of Levi. To the east, at the entrance to the tabernacle, were Moses, Aaron, and the priests. The cloud lifted from the tabernacle. It was time to leave Sinai. When the Israelite people set out, they packed everything and organized themselves by tribe. In front of them all was the Ark of the Covenant, which was carried by the Levites as God had asked. They were heading for the desert of Paran. One day, on the way, the people complained again about their hardships. God listened to the complaints. He became angry with them, and his fire consumed the surroundings of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses. He prayed to God for them, and the fire went out. That is why that place became known as Taborah, where the fire of God burned among them. On the third day of the journey, the foreign people who had mixed in with the Israelites had a great desire for food. The Israelites also complained and whispered again. They said, Oh, how delicious it was to eat meat. Do you remember when we ate fish for free in Egypt? And everybody sighed. Oh, yes, that's true. And like that, everyone began to talk against Moses. They were tired of eating manna. Do you all remember the melons? <sighs> and the cucumbers and leeks. <sighs> and the onions and garlic. 
Moses heard the family's complaining. And so, very unhappy, Moses prayed to God. O oh Lord, if I am your servant, why do you harm me? Why do you deny me your favor and force me to care for all these people? Am I like their mother in the way that you demand that I take care of them and take them to the land that you promised their ancestors? I just can't take it with these people. It's too heavy a burden for me. If this is the deal you're going to give me, you'd be doing me a favor if you take my life. That way, I would be free from my misfortune. And God responded to him, Bring me seventy elders of Israel. I will share with them the spirit that is upon you, so that they can help you carry the burden that you have with these people. That way, you won't have to carry it alone. And to the people, you will say the following. Moses listened attentively to what God told him and shared with the people. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, for you are going to eat meat. All of you who were complaining to the Lord, saying that you wanted meat and that you had a better time in Egypt, God will give you meat and you will have to eat it. You won't eat it for one day, not two, not ten, but a whole month until it makes you nauseous. And this is because you haven't appreciated God who is in your midst and for crying, saying you would rather be in Egypt. The next morning, God caused quail to fall again. But this time, there were many more than the last time. And they all began to eat, to eat and eat. They ate so much that many died of gluttony. That is why they call that place Kibroth Hateava, because the gluttonous people were buried there. Then the people set out for Hazaroth, and they camped there. While in that land, Miriam and Aaron began to speak against their brother Moses because of his wife. Miriam said, Moses is married to a woman who is not even an Israelite. Do you think that's okay? Also, hasn't God spoken to someone other than Moses? God has spoken to us too. God heard everything they said. God knew that Moses was a very humble man, humbler than anyone else on earth. So he told Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to gather in the tabernacle. Hey! Then God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent. Aaron, Miriam, God called them and they stepped closer. Listen to my words. If there were a prophet among you, I, the Lord, would speak to him in visions and I would speak to him in dreams. However, this does not happen with my servant Moses, who has always been faithful to me. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and without enigmas. He sees how I am. How could you huh? speak without fear against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and then he departed. As soon as the cloud moved away from the tabernacle, Miriam's skin turned as white as snow. Miriam. When Aaron looked at her, he saw that she had an infectious disease. She had leprosy. Oh my God. So Aaron pleaded with Moses. I'm begging you, Moses. Do not hold us accountable for this sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not allow this evil against Miriam. Blah, 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 blah. Moses begged God. Oh God, have mercy. I beg you to please heal her. And God answered him. If your father had spit on your sister's face, wouldn't she feel ashamed? Well, let her be removed from the camp for seven days. 
Then she can come back. Moses told them what God had said to him. So, Miriam had to stay outside the camp for seven days. The Israelite people did not move until she returned. When the seven days were up, Miriam came back completely healthy. The three siblings were happy to be together again and hugged each other. With this, they learned a valuable lesson. That speaking against others is not right and does not please God. The Israelites had left Hazaroth and camped in the desert of Paran. There, God spoke to Moses. Huh? I want you to send some of your men to explore the land of Canaan, the land that I will give to the Israelites. You will choose a leader from each tribe to represent it. Tell them to see what kind of land it is and find out what the people who live there are like. Okay. Moses did as God commanded. He sought out 12 leaders from each tribe to explore the land including Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim hey. and Caleb from the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. Moses said to them, Go up the Negev until you reach the mountain. Go as spies to explore the land of Canaan. Look at its inhabitants and its warriors to discover if there are many or if there are few. Examine the terrain to see if the cities are open or have walls. Find out if the land is good or bad. And if it has trees, bring some fruits from the country. And the twelve spies set out for Canaan. After 40 days, the twelve men returned from exploring that land. Moses, Aaron, and the entire Israelite community gathered eagerly to find out what Canaan was like. The spies reported to all of them and showed them the fruits of the land. Joshua and Caleb said, Yes, you should all see land. It is so beautiful, with many big trees and hills. There are flowers everywhere and the harvests are good and abundant. Mm -hmm. ah. It really is, as mm. God promised. A land okay. of milk and honey. Um, yes, there is only one problem, said one of the spies. The people who live there are powerful and have very good warriors. The cities are huge and fortified. We even saw giant men, the Amalekites, Hittites, Jebusites and Amortites all live near there. It's true, there are too many enemies. Mm -hmm. Caleb made the people quiet down before Moses, and he said, Let's go conquer the land. I am sure we can do it. God will help us. But the others responded, We cannot fight those people. They are stronger than us. Blah, 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 the other spies blah, 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 disagreed blah, 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 blah. with Joshua yeah. and Caleb. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. They did not trust that God would help them win the battle. So, they began to spread false rumors among the Israelites about the land they had explored. The Israelites believed those men, instead of believing God's promises. And the entire Israelite community began to scream and cry in their murmurings against Moses and Aaron. The community said, how we wish we could have died in Egypt. We'd be better off than dying in this desert. Why has God brought us to this earth? To be slain to death while our wives and children become spoils of war? Wouldn't it be better if we went back to Egypt? And others said to each other, let's choose a new leader who will take us to Egypt. Huh? Me. <laughs> then Moses and Aaron fell to their knees before the entire Israelite community. Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes as a sign of mourning and told the community, 
The land we explored is unbelievably good. If God is pleased with us, he will allow us to enter it. He is going to give us a land where milk and honey abound. So do not rebel against God and do not be afraid of the people who live in that land. God is on our side. Do not be afraid. But the whole community talked about stoning him. So the glory of God was manifested in the tabernacle in front of all of the Israelites. Uh -huh. Oh my God. Hey. Then God told Moses, How long will these people continue to belittle me? How long will they keep doubting me despite all the wonders I've created among them? I will hurt them all. And from you, Moses, I will make a people greater and stronger than this. Mm. Moses begged God, O oh God Almighty, the Egyptians know your power well from when you freed these people. Not only did they see how you freed them, but they also know, my Lord, that you are in the midst of all of them. So, if you hurt these people, the nations that have heard of your fame will say, the Lord was not able to take these people to the land that he promised to give them, and ended up killing them in the desert. So now, God, I beg you to let your power be felt and keep your promise. For your great love, I beg you to forgive the wickedness of these people, just as you have been forgiving them since they left Egypt. You ask me to forgive them, and I will forgive them, God said. All those who saw my glory and wonders in Egypt and in the desert, all of those who disobeyed me and put me to the test several times, will never see the land that I promised to give their fathers. None of them who despised me will ever see it. Instead, my servants Joshua and Caleb, who have shown a different attitude, and have been faithful to me, they will see the land they explored, and their descendants will inherit it. God left a message from Moses and Aaron to tell the Israelites. And Moses said to the people, God says what you wished for will be fulfilled. All of you will die in the desert. None of those who are over the age of 20 who murmured against God, will be able to enter the land that he promised them. Only Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun, will enter. The children that you said would be spoils of war will also enter the land, and they will be the ones to enjoy the land that you rejected. Your corpses will be left lying in the desert. Uh -oh. huh? You will wander for 40 years, until the last of you falls. Forty, 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 forty. The spies spent 40 days exploring Canaan, so you will suffer a year for each day. 40 years they will carry their wickedness on their backs, and thus they will know what it is to have God as an enemy. When the people heard this, they all wept bitterly. They repented. However, it was too late. God had already made a decision. The next morning, despite God's punishment, a group of soldiers decided that since the promised land was so close, they would go and fight the Canaanites anyway. Among them, they said, let's go up to the place that God has promised us because we recognize that we have sinned. Hey. But Moses told them, Why have you disobeyed huh? God's orders again? This is not going to work for you. If you go hmm. there, your enemies will defeat you, because God is not with you. You will have to face the Amalekites and the Canaanites. They will kill you with the edge of their swords. Hmm. Since you have turned away from the Lord, he will not help you. Blah, 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 blah. However, they blah, blah, did blah, not blah, blah. listen to Moses. The Amalekites huh? and Canaanites who lived in that area came down. Blah, 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 blah. 
fought against the Israelites and easily defeated them. God could have brought the Israelites to the Promised Land in less than a year. But because of their rebellion, they would all have to wander the desert for 40 years. Even though God had punished the Israelites, a Levite named Korah dared to conspire against Moses and Aaron. Korah organized about 250 Israelites and said, Why do we have to listen to Moses and Aaron? Because of them, we have not been able to enter the Promised Land. Also, who tells us that they were chosen by God? What we need are new leaders. Yes, someone like me. Yes, why not? Of course. Thank you for choosing me. So, Korah and the group of Israelites went to Moses and Aaron and told them, We are tired of your arrogance. This whole community is holy, and the Lord is amid all of us. Why do you think you are the owners of us all? When Moses heard what they were saying, he bowed down before them and answered Korah and his whole group. Tomorrow, tomorrow God will show who is his and who is holy. He will be the one to declare who is his chosen. Yeah. You and all who are with you bring censers before the Lord. You will bring yours too, Aaron. Then we will know who God chose. Yeah. Moses told the Levites, Hear me now, Levites. Does it seem little to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the community so that you can serve him directly, work in the tabernacle, and distinguish yourself as servants of the people? God himself has placed you by his side, Korah, and yeah. all the Levites. Now you also want Aaron's priesthood? Well, know that you are rebelling against the Lord, not against me. Tell me, what has Aaron done? What has this man done for you to speak against him? Moses sent for some men named Dathan and Abiram. But they answered, No, we won't go. After taking us out of Egypt, now you want to kill us all in this desert? Do you want to continue to rule over us? <laughs> the truth is that you have not managed to take us to the land where milk and honey abound. Nah. All you want is to continue to rule over us with lies. Well, not anymore. Nah. Extremely ah. angry, Moses said to the ah. Lord, My Lord, do not accept the offering they bring you, for I have not taken even one donkey from them, nor have I done them any harm. You and your people present yourselves here tomorrow, each one with his censer. God will have the last word. Yeah. So the next day, each man with his censer stood at the entrance of the tabernacle, together with Moses and Aaron. When Korah had gathered all his people, the glory of God was manifested before all of them. Then God said to Moses and Aaron, Moses, Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation so that I may consume them once and for all. But Moses and Aaron bowed down with their faces to the ground and exclaimed, Lord, God of all mankind, because of the sin of some men, are you going to be angry with all of them? And so God said to Moses, Order them to move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses quickly warned the people, Stay away from the shops of these ungodly men. Do not touch any of their belongings, so that you will not be punished for the sins of these men. The people quickly moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Moses continued speaking, now you are going to know if the Lord has sent me to do all these things, or if I am acting of my own free will. If these men die naturally, as is the fate of all men, 
then you will know that God did not send me. But if God causes something out of the ordinary to happen and causes the earth to open up before them and swallow them up with all their belongings, then you will know that these men disparaged the God of Israel. <laughs> You're a liar. Let's go back to our tents. As soon as Moses finished speaking, they heard a strange noise. The ground began to shake, and then the ground opened under all of them. It opened and swallowed them and their families alive, along with Korah's people and possessions. And the earth closed in on them. Hearing them shout, the Israelites who were with Korah fled from there, exclaiming, Let's run, lest the earth swallow us too! But those 250 men were consumed by the fire of the Lord, and they died. Oh, oh, oh my... Huh? <laughs> <coughs> Oh my God! Later, God commanded Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring twelve staffs. Let the leader of each tribe bring one staff. You will write the name of each of them on their own stick. On the staff of the Levites, you shall write Aaron's name. Then, place them in front of the Ark of the Covenant, inside the tabernacle. The rod that sprouts plants will be my chosen one. In this way, I will get rid of the constant complaints that the Israelites raise against you regarding your leadership. Moses did just that. He communicated the information to the Israelites, and the chiefs gave him 12 rods, each one for its patriarchal family. Among them was Aaron's rod. Moses placed the staves before the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. The next day, Moses went back into the tabernacle and, upon oh. looking, saw that one of the rods had sprouted flowers, leaves, and almonds. So he took them out of there and set them before the Israelites so that they could see for themselves what had happened. And each leader took his own staff. The rod that had sprouted flowers had Aaron's name on it. God had chosen Aaron to continue being the high priest of the people of Israel. And so, Moses kept in the Ark of the Covenant the tablets of the commandment, Aaron's staff, and the manna that God gave them. God asked Moses to keep them so that the people would always remember who the chosen one was that God had always taken care of them and would continue to take care of them, and the mandates that God had given them. The Israelites continued to wander through the desert. During those trips, a long time has already passed. It had been almost 40 years. The generation that had come out of Egypt were already old, and the children were already young adults. Oh my god! The Israelite community arrived in the desert of Zin, and they camped at Kadesh. It was there that Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, died and was buried. As there was a great scarcity of water, the Israelites once again mutinied against Moses and Aaron and demanded of them, I wish God had let us die in the desert together with our brothers. Why did you bring us to this desert to die with our cattle? Why did you take us out of Egypt and bring us to this horrible place where there is nothing? 
Moses and Aaron went to the entrance of the tabernacle and bowed down with their faces to the ground to ask God for help. And God said to Moses, Moses, take your staff, gather the people, and go to the rock in the presence of all of them. Only you will speak to the rock for it to give water, and thus water will flow from it. This way, all the people and their cattle can drink. So they did. Moses and Aaron gathered everyone in front of the rock. Moses, very old and tired of the complaints of the people, said to all of them, Listen up, rebels! Do we have to get you water from this rock? Saying this, Moses angrily raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the rod. Water flowed from it in abundance, and everyone drank. God told Moses and Aaron, Why have you disobeyed me? I asked you to only speak to the rock. Because you did not trust me, nor recognize my holiness in the presence of the Israelites, you will not enter the promised land either. These waters are known as the source of Meribah, because it was there that the Israelites made claims against God, and where he manifested his holiness. The people continued advancing from Cades. The Israelites wanted to pass through the town of Edom. Edom was the town of the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. So they were all family. Moses sent a message to the king of Edom, asking him to let them pass through his land. The message said, Let us pass through the main road. We will not enter any field or vineyard, nor drink water from any well. We will only go through the main road until we leave your territory. But the king responded, Don't even try to cross my domain. Otherwise, I will come out with my army and attack you. But Moses insisted, We will only pass through the main road. If any of us drink water from your wells, we will pay you. But the king was decisive in his answer. You won't pass through here. So the Israelite people took a detour and came to Mount Hor, near the border of Edom. There, God told Moses and Aaron, Soon Aaron will depart from this world, so he will not enter the promised land. Take Aaron and his son to Mount Hor. There you shall remove Aaron's priestly garments and put them on his son Eliezer. And there Aaron will meet with his ancestors. When Moses did what God asked of him, there... On the top of the mountain, at the age of 123, Aaron, yeah. Moses' brother, died, and they buried him right there. When the people learned of Aaron's death, they cried and mourned him for 30 days. <laughs> the Israelites came out of Mount Hor, bordering the territory of Edom. Along the way, despite the fact that there was very little time left before the 40 years of punishment was up, the people complained again and began to speak against God and against Moses. Why did they bring us from Egypt to die in this desert? There's no bread or water here, and we are sick of this lousy food. Therefore, God punished them by sending poisonous snakes against them so that they would bite them, and many Israelites died. Ah! 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 Ah!
The people approached Moses, Hi. beseeching him. We have sinned by speaking against God mm -hmm. and against you. Pray to the Lord to remove those snakes. Moses interceded for the people, and God said to him, Create a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. All who are bitten and look at her will live. Moses made a bronze serpent and raised it up on a pole. Blah, 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 blah. People who were bitten and looked at the bronze serpent were healed. This symbolized faith in God. If God said that looking at the bronze serpent they would be healed, then it would be so. Through faith, the power of God could be manifested in them and heal them all. Even though the Israelite people continued to rebel and disobey, God never stopped providing them with food and water. The Israelites were getting closer to the Promised Land. They camped near the fields of a kingdom called Moab. During their journey, the Israelites encountered various nations that forced them to fight against them. But since God was on their side, the Israelites won all of the battles. The news about their victories had reached everywhere. The king of Moab, he learned of all they had done with the Amorites. And he realized that they were camping near his territories. The Moabites felt very fearful of the Israelites. And they were truly terrified of them, because they were a very large army. At that time, Balak was the king of Moab. Balak knew he had no hope of defeating the Israelites. Then he had the idea to send for a man named Balaam. Who? Balaam was very famous because it was said that whatever he blessed was truly blessed and whatever he cursed was really cursed. So, Balak sent messengers to hire Balaam. They took a lot of gold with them to pay him. Although Balaam was not an Israelite, he believed in God. He used to be a prophet. But he became greedy and no longer served God. When the messengers arrived, they said to Balaam, There is a people that came from Egypt. They have a very powerful army, and they are camping near the territory of Moab. King Balak begs you to go and curse that town so Balak can defeat them and throw them out of his territory. Balaam invited them to spend the night there, promising to give them an answer after God told him. The messenger stayed there with him. At night, God spoke to Balaam and said, Who are these men that are staying with you? They are the messengers that Balak sent, the king of Moab, Balaam replied. He sent them to tell me to go curse a people that came out of Egypt because they are more powerful than him. But God told Balaam, Don't go with them. You will not produce any curse on the Israelites, because they are a blessed people. The next day, Balaam sent the messengers back to their land. But King Balak sent other rulers, who were more numerous and distinguished, with a lot more gold. And they said to Balaam, King Balak says not to let anything prevent you from going to see him. He will reward you handsomely and will do whatever you ask of him. He beseeches you to go curse the people. Balaam responded, Even if King Balak gave me his palace full of gold and silver, I could not do anything if God does not allow me to. You too can stay here tonight while I find out if God wants to tell me something else. That night, God spoke to Balaam, and he told him, These men have already come to call for you. Go with them, 
but you will only do what I tell you to do. In the morning, Balaam got his donkey and set out with the rulers of Moab. What he really wanted was the compensation while he was with them. God saw Balaam's intention and sent an angel with a sword. When the donkey saw the angel, she drew back towards the camp. Balaam hit her to get her back on the road, but she took him to a place where there were stone walls. The angel appeared once again. When the donkey saw the angel, she fearfully leaned against the wall, with which she hurt Balaam's foot. So Balaam hit her again a second time. The angel approached them since it was a very narrow place. The donkey got more scared and she fell to the ground with Balaam on top of her. So Balaam's anger was kindled and he hit the donkey even harder with the stick. And suddenly, God made the donkey speak and she said to Balaam, Why do you hit me? What have I done to you for you to have hit me three times? Balaam was so angry that he didn't even realize that he was talking to a donkey. And he said, You made a fool of me. If I had had a sword in my hands, I would have killed you right away. Am I not the donkey on which you have always ridden until today? Have I ever done something like this? No. Then God opened Balaam's eyes and he could see the angel on the path wielding the sword. Balaam bowed down, and the angel asked, Why did you hit your donkey? Don't you realize that I'm not willing to let you pass because I have seen your bad intentions? When your donkey saw me, she got away from me three times. If it weren't for her, you would be dead, and she would be alive. I have sinned, said Balaam. I didn't realize your presence on my path. Since this seems bad to you, I'm going back. The angel told Balaam, go with them. But just say only what God tells you to say. And Balaam went with the men of the king, Balak. When King Balak found out that Balaam was coming, he came out to meet him and he told him, <laughs> it's so good that you came! So good that you're here! I need you to curse these people. Hey, why didn't you come when I first sent for you? You don't think I can compensate you properly? Well, now I'm here, answered Balaam. I just can't say anything that God doesn't put in my mouth. Come, come! I have many gifts for you! There will be many gifts if you do this job for me! So the King Balak took Balaam to a mountain. From there, they could see part of the Israelites' camp. They built altars and prepared burnt offerings, just as Balaam had requested. And the king told Balaam, There they are! Curse them! God put his word in Balaam's mouth and said, People of Israel, how can I wish evil on whom God does not wish it? From the top of the mountain I see it, and from the hills I contemplate it. It is a group that lives on its own, that is not counted among the nations. Blessed be all of you. When King Balak heard this, he exclaimed, What have you done? I brought you here to curse them. Why have you blessed them? Shouldn't I say what God tells me? Said Balaam. Okay, okay. Maybe you're a little nervous. Let's go to another mountain. Maybe there you'll feel better. Come, come. So, the King Balak took Balaam to another mountain. They took altars and prepared burnt offerings once again. The King Balak told him, Okay now, you are better here for sure. Curse the people. God put his words in Balaam's mouth, and he said, People of Israel, blessed be all of you. The Lord your God is with you. God took them out of Egypt with the force of a wild bull. 
against Israel. There is no curse that will work, nor will sorcery work against them. Of Jacob and of Israel it will be said, Look what God has done. The king Balak said to Balaam, Hey, hey, if you aren't going to curse them, don't bless them either. Balaam responded, Didn't I warn you that I would repeat everything that God ordered me to say? Mm. Come with me to another spot, said the king Balak. Maybe God will think it's okay for you to curse them from another spot. So he took Balaam to another mountain that was even taller. They prepared altars and burnt offerings once again. When Balaam looked up and saw the people of Israel camping by their tribes, the Spirit of God came over him and said, How beautiful your tents are, Jacob! How beautiful your camp is, Israel! They are like streams that widen, like gardens by the river, like those that are planted by God. Their pitchers overflow with water. Their seed enjoys an abundance of water. Their king is the greatest, and his kingdom grows. Who would dare to disturb them? Blessed be those who bless you, and cursed be those who curse you. So Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he said to him, I sent for you so that you would curse them, and this is the third time that you bless them. You better get back to your own land. I told you I would compensate you, but now I won't give you anything. I told your messengers that even if you gave me your palace full of gold and silver, I wouldn't be able to disobey the Lord my God. What God tells me, that is what I'll say. I will return to my home, but I'm going to warn you as to what this group will do with your kingdom one day. So Balaam prophesied. I see it. But not now. I contemplate it, but not up close. A star will rise from Jacob. A king will rise in Israel and will crush all the land of Moab. Edom will be conquered. The Amalekites will have a total destruction. Seir, their enemy, will be dominated, while Israel will accomplish feats. From Israel will come a sovereign. After that, Balaam got up and returned to his land, and Balak also went on his own path. There were the people of Israel rebelling against God, oh my God. having no idea that there in the mountains, God was protecting them and blessing them. The Israelites were getting closer to arriving to the promised land, Canaan. They camped in the fields of Moab, next to the Jordan River, very close to Jericho. Since a lot of time had passed, God asked for Moses and the priest Eliezer, son of Aaron, to do a second census. God told them, hold a census of all the community of Israel. Count everyone by patriarchal family, write down all of their names, and make a list of all the men over the age of 20 who are fit for war. And that is what they did. Moses and the priest Eliezer spoke to the people, and they once again counted the Israelites one by one. They organized them by tribes, and they recruited young men ready to fight in the wars that would arise. Later, God said to Moses, Divide the land of Canaan among the tribes as their inheritance. Do it according to a number of names that are on the list. To the largest tribe you will give the largest estate, and to the smallest tribe you will give the smallest estate. Each tribe will receive their inheritance according to the number of people counted. Okay. And that is how Moses did it. He distributed the inheritance tribe by tribe, as God had requested. Oh my God. Oh my God. When it was time to count the members of Manasseh's tribe, who was the first son of Joseph, there was the family of a man who had already died. 
This man had been named Zelophehad. Zelophehad had not had any sons, but had five daughters. They were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, Tirza. When it was time to count Zelophehad's family, and they saw that there were only women, they said, Hmm? No, 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 I'm sorry. We cannot count you. Zelophehad's name will be erased because, well, he didn't have a son, and he has no one to claim his inheritance. Only sons have the right to an inheritance. So, ladies, I'm very sorry. And they responded, Hey, wait a minute! We have a right too! Although our father did not have any sons, we can have the inheritance. Why does our father's name have to be removed? Well, those are the rules. That's how it has always been. Why should it be different for you? So, seeing that it was not fair, they decided to talk to Moses to ask for justice so that they had the right to inherit what their father had left. The five girls approached the entrance of the tabernacle and asked to speak with Moses. Moses agreed to talk to them. As they got closer, people stared at them and murmured, Oh, these girls are so bold! Wow, they are so brave! They are wasting their time! When they got to Moses, they said, Moses, we are here to ask for justice. Our father, Zelophehad, died without having any sons. Well, we are his only children. He was a good man. He was never against God, nor did he participate in Korah's rebellion. He died in the desert for his own sin. It isn't fair for our father's name to be erased just because he didn't have any sons. We are his daughters. We can inherit. We are part of this village. Give us an inheritance among the relatives of our father's estate. Moses knew that their request was somewhat just. So he told them that he would consult with God. And after, he would give them a response. So Moses did it. He presented their case to God, and God responded, What Zelophehad's daughters are asking for is just. So you should give them a property among their father's relatives. Give them what they ask for, Zelophehad's inheritance. Also, tell the Israelites, God added, Starting now, when a man dies without leaving any sons, his inheritance will be given to his daughters. If he doesn't have daughters, his siblings will receive his inheritance. And if he doesn't have siblings, it will be given to his closest relative, so that they can take possession of the inheritance. When Moses went to them, he gave them good news. Everyone in the village was surprised at how these brave women had faced the situation. The daughters did not care what others said because they knew what was just and what was right. Subscribe, share, comment if you can. Follow us on our social media. Wait, I think something is missing. Moses. You'll go up Mount Abarim, and from there, you'll be able to consider the land that you will give to the Israelites. After you have considered the land that you will give to the Israelites, you will part from this earth to reunite with your ancestors, just like your brother Aaron. In the desert of Zin, when the village started demanding for water, you and Aaron disobeyed me by taking water from the rock. You did not recognize my holiness before the people. Moses asked God to name a new leader to guide the village when he is no longer there. Lord of all of humanity, name a leader for this community. 
one who will lead in his campaigns, who will take them to war, and will bring them back home. That way the people of the Lord will not be like a flock without a shepherd. God told Moses who the new leader would be. He ordered him to, in front of the priest Eliezer and all of the community, name him as leader, to put him in some of his clothing, so that the Israelite community would obey him. He would lay his hands over him and hand over the responsibility. That's what Moses did. In the desert, to the east of Jordan, Moses gathered all the people for his last speech to the new generation of Israelites who is on the verge of entering the promised land, Canaan. All of them were the children and grandchildren of the Israelites who left Egypt. Moses began his speech, recalling how rebellious their parents were. In that time, I told them that I alone could not do it with all of you. The Lord your God has made you so numerous that now you are as many as the stars in the sky. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, multiply you by a thousand, and may he bless you just as he promised. I alone couldn't keep taking care of all the problems, charges, and litigations amongst all of you. So it was agreed to assign wise leaders from each tribe to help me. In the desert of Paran, we obeyed God when he asked us to explore the land of Canaan. We sent 12 spies, one from each tribe. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, brought us some of the fruit from the land and informed us on how great that land God gave us was. Still, the rest of the spies filled the village with fear, telling us that we would be destroyed because they were more powerful than we were. And everyone refused to go to war, and they rebelled against the order from God. They began to murmur in their tents, saying that God abhors us, and that he made us leave Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites and destroy us. They were told that God would guide us and fight for all of us, just as he had done in Egypt and in the desert. But despite this, none of you trusted in God. God became angry and made an oath that not a single man from the wicked generation would see the great land of Canaan. Only Joshua and Caleb would be able to see the land because they trusted in God. The community showed regret, but it was too late. Some even went to fight against the Amorites, but God warned them that he would not be with them. They were easily defeated. Because of them, the Lord also got mad at me when he asked me to speak to the rock. But because I was tired of the complaints, I ended up disobeying God. And I hit the rock instead of talking to it. And God told me that I also wouldn't enter the promised land. Moses said all of this because he wanted the new generation to be different from that of their parents rebellious and disobedient. <laughs> Instead, they should love God and obey Him. He reminded them of the Ten Commandments. He talked about each one in great detail so that they would keep them in their hearts and fulfill them. Later, Moses said, Listen, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and all your strength. Speak to your children about this time. From the time they wake up, when they are out, when they are home, and when they go to sleep. Put it in the entrance of your houses and throughout the city so that you may never forget. Moses made it clear to everyone that they should not adore or worship hey, any man blah, blah, blah. nor any woman nor any animal, nor any object, because they are creations. Instead, they should only worship the one true God. Later, Moses repeated, expanded on, and clarified a set of great laws. That is where the name of the book of Deuteronomy comes from, which means second law. This talked about laws on how Israel should worship God, laws on how to be a good leader, 
civil laws like marriage, family, justice, and business. And later, more laws about worshiping God. These laws were perfect for the well-being of all of them. Later, Moses warns about the consequences of their obedience and disobedience. If you obey, you will bring blessings, but if you disobey, you will bring curses. Today, I will allow you to choose between life and death, between good and evil. Today, I tell you to love the Lord your God, to move along your paths and follow the commandments, precepts, and laws. That way, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the promised land. But if your hearts rebel and you don't obey Him, and you decide to worship and serve other gods, I'm warning you now that you will not live long in the land that you will possess. So, be smart. Choose the life path that will bring you blessings. Later, blah, 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 Moses blah, 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 blah. said, I am very old, and I don't have much time left in this life. I can't continue being your leader. The Lord has told me that I will not cross the Jordan. Huh? Huh? Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. He has ordered huh? me to name a new leader who will take you to the promised land. That new leader will be Joshua. Huh? Joshua? The Lord your God will march in front of you all to destroy all the nations that will be in your way, and you will seize the territory. Have no fear. Don't be scared of these nations, because the Lord your God will always be with you. He will never leave you, nor will he abandon you. So, in the presence of all the Israelites, God descended from a cloud at the entrance of the tabernacle. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, hmm? Mm -hmm. What? Oh my god. Ah! Oh my god. Hey, hey, hey. Moses said to Joshua, Be strong and brave, because you will enter with these people into the land that God promised you. Mm -hmm. God himself will march before you, mm -hmm. and he will be with you. He will never leave you, nor will he abandon you. Don't be afraid, and don't let anyone intimidate you. Mm -hmm. Moses wrote the laws that he had talked about in his speech. He himself had been writing the history of his ancestors, which were divided onto five scrolls. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five are called Pentateuch, and in Hebrew, it is known as the Torah. And it was given to the Levites, who transported the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. so that the laws would be together with it. Despite everything, God and Moses knew that the Israelites would disobey, and that they would continue to be rebellious, just like the past generation. But they had hope that one day the people of Israel would return to God. Yeah. God told Moses that it was time to go up into the mountains of Abiram. Hmm. Moses blessed the tribe and said goodbye. He went up the mountain. There, in the plains of Moab, in the mountains of Abiram and Mount Nebo, God showed him all the land of Canaan and the lands surrounding it. Later, God said to Moses, this is the land I swore to give to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not be able to enter. At that time, Moses was 120 years old. Despite being very old, he still had good eyesight, and he hadn't lost his vigor. And there in Moab, Moses died as a servant of the Lord. Just as God had said, he was buried in Moab. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. From then on, in Israel, there never emerged another prophet like Moses, with whom God had direct contact. Only Moses made those signals and wonders that the Lord ordered to be carried out in Egypt before the Pharaoh 
his officials, and his entire country. Nobody else has demonstrated such an extraordinary power, or has been capable of carrying out the exploits that Moses did before all of Israel.